Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. It's Effie. And today I have Megan from Arthritis Maggie over on Instagram. And we are going to be talking about insurances and all that hassle. So I was initially diagnosed with JIA in 1995. Um, and I did treatment for a couple of years, uh, you know, steroid shots, lots of high doses of Motrin and ibuprofen, those types of things. That's what they were giving us back then. Um, and I was luckily, I was able to go into remission when I was around 10 years old and that lasted until I was 18. Um, and that's when I started to have more arthritis symptoms come back in. Um, oddly enough, I was unable to get treatment for a number of years, even with that history of JIA, um, rheumatologists were looking at me like this is isolated because it's mostly my elbow and then my knee. So it took about eight years to then get back into treatment for arthritis. Um, it was almost like I waited for the other shoe to drop until doctors could no longer deny it was anything but. And then it was came down to a matter of process of elimination of what kind of inflammatory arthritis are we looking at? Um, because I was negative for rheumatoid factor. And I had no active psoriasis at that time, but a uh, family history of it. And a lot of my arthritis symptoms are very specific to psoriatic arthritis, like the enthesitis pain um, at the tendons. And I have like the swelling of the sp full swelling of my fingers, things like that. So we came to the conclusion of psoriatic arthritis and, um, and that's been, gosh, two and a half years now and it's been a lot easier to treat it now that we actually know what it is. I've met a lot of people with uh, psoriatic arthritis. They've found people say that it's not really a, a, a considered a form of arthritis. Have you ever seen that push? Kind of? I felt more so just that like not a lot of people know what it is, yeah. how it affects your body. It's, it's just very much unheard of mm -hmm. and um, that was sort of like my calling to create my page because I was looking around Instagram for accounts to follow relating to arthritis just in general. And I noticed there weren't many people discussing specifically psoriatic arthritis. And it made me realize that maybe perhaps the reason why it took so long for me to figure out my diagnosis is because people just simply don't know enough about it. Even rheumatologists, admittedly, a couple of them, um, unfamiliar. I know my dad actually had psoriasis. Um, he was diagnosed in his 30s. So growing up, I was kind of always worried that I would get psoriasis, you know, because there is a hereditary link, yeah. but I got rheumatoid arthritis. So I got something totally different, which can happen. And like you said that you have a family history. So are like anyone in your immediate family have this, or is it more like my, uh, my maternal grandmother had like widespread psoriasis and I don't really recall her having terrible arthritis per se. I bet she had a little bit going on, but she had a lot of health issues. So things, you know, get wrapped up together often. Um, yeah. She was very overweight. So I think that complaints of joint pain usually were, you know, to push towards that. For psoriatic arthritis, I think now it's starting to be looked at from more of like an umbrella and this, the, I'm probably going to butcher this word, the spondyloropathies. Yeah, those are um, hard words. <laughs> right. With like ankylosing spondylitis. So there's a lot of similarities with those two. And that's also a considered like a seronegative. There's no real like blood tests for these uh, particular forms of arthritis. So it can be uh, quite a process finding that diagnosis. Yeah. And I remember my dad kind of having aches and pains, but I mean, it wasn't told him that he had arthritis, but you know, who knows? Who knows? Maybe he did. Yeah. Because I had a rheumatologist tell me that I saw, he's like, you know, you also have that too. Even though I wasn't diagnosed right. with it, it was just, it's in like kind of your yeah, like for example, my doc, you know, I have a lot of uh, low back and like axial related arthritis. Um, mm -hmm. I have it in my chest even, mm -hmm. and uh, like where the rib meets the costochondritis. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I said to my doctor, like, would the you know a lot of the symptoms I have would fall under the AS diagnosis? And she said, at this point, like your arthritis is just that big umbrella. Like it's all we're just going to consider it all PSA at this point because it all crosses over so much. Yeah. And then when it comes to like, obviously what we're talking about today, we kind of went on a tangent, but that's okay. Right. For the it context. To, yeah. How has it been when it comes to treating the condition and getting coverage for the medications needed? It's definitely tricky. Um, so I 
currently I'm under coverage by Cigna and which I get that through my husband's work. We're very lucky that I'm able to get insured that way. And it's fairly affordable for commercial private insurance. Um, but I feel that it's definitely geared toward a healthier person. What they want to cover is not much. I have to fight them often with like the step therapies, you know, they'll, they'll suggest a much cheaper option and ask you to take medications that weren't actually prescribed to you yeah. to try instead, which always just absolutely blows my mind that they are able to do that. And that that's, you know, how our system works because you would think that going to the doctor, that's who's making your decision about your treatment, you and your doctor. But um, I've faced a lot of pushback from insurance, trying to put me back on Humira, for example, which I failed already. So it's interesting that they can keep coming back and saying, okay, that didn't work. Well, try this one, which is a biosimilar. You know, when you already had a bad reaction to one, why would you want to go back to something similar? So, you know, it's, and you have to end up working with your doctor. It's definitely been a struggle to get them to fill what I'm asking for, because the problem is, I think the insurance companies look at arthritis, inflammatory arthritis as one disease category and the drugs that they will cover in that category as a whole. But what research finds is that there are slightly differing ways to treat RA versus PSA versus AS. So when they lump us all together and try to push us onto these step therapies, it's not productive in the long run because you know, really, I feel like I'm getting more sick waiting in this process. My arthritis is progressing while I wait for the medication to be approved. It's a little backwards. Yeah. And that's what I don't think insurances understand. It's not as black and white and people on the outside too, who don't live with our conditions, then you don't know all this step therapy and all this backwards stuff that's going on. I mean, how did you navigate it though? Like a lot of people aren't as lucky when it comes to getting out of that step therapy trap. So how did you get through that? So just being completely open with my doctor. um, And I'm really lucky that I've, I've come to a point in my arthritis life (laughs) that I can recognize whether or not a doctor is going to like be a teammate or not, you know, you really want somebody that's actively engaged in treating your arthritis. And my doctor, she works at hospital for special surgery in New York city. Mm -hmm. I've found that going to a larger hospital, even if it requires a little bit of travel, if you're able to do it, the quality of care is just a little bit more like than your local rheumatology practice, private practice that might be seeing more osteoarthritis rather than these aggressive inflammatory arthritis. So my, my rheumatologist specializes in psoriatic arthritis and she has uh, been battling with me throughout this, sending the prior auths, doing um, petitions, whatever it might require. For example, um, the insurance really did not want to cover methotrexate injections beyond just the bottle and the syringe, which if you think about it for somebody with arthritis, especially I have poor dexterity and flexibility in my hands and my wrists. Mm. So the reality is I actually cannot maneuver that, that way of taking that medicine. Um, and the fact that my doctor even has to then come back and say, Hey, she needs an auto injector because she can't utilize that apparatus, that way of, of taking the medicine. It shows just how separate they actually are. Like they don't even understand what the drugs are prescribed for. You know, that somebody who needs this medication probably doesn't have the best use of their hands. (laughs) It's, Yeah. And I actually had that situation happen to me too, where they were like, oh yeah, it's covered. But then when I went to read the fine print, it was the syringe. And I mean, I used the syringe when I was on Embril because I didn't have a choice in 2005 when I was on it, they didn't come up with the auto injector yet. At that time, like my hands weren't as bad as they are now, but you know, it still was difficult if my hand was hurting or like my wrist was inflamed, for instance. And I also felt it was more nerve wracking. Like everyone should have their own personal preference and how they want to administer their medicine that's going into their body. Right. So, I mean, some people prefer pills that works with them. That didn't work for me in certain respects with methotrexate, but for Embrel, I really like the auto injector because I just don't have to figure out the 45 degree angle. Not everybody has that like, you know, comfortable medical background where they're right. And also honestly, like it's, it can take some energy and, and 
physically and mentally to, you know, load up a dose and yeah. make sure you've got it right. Like if you're foggy, I think that would make me nervous. Like, God forbid you misdose your methotrexate because you're not thinking as clearly because you're flaring. Yeah. I haven't had like a lot of pushback with step therapy because I've been lucky to have doctors who were able to fill out the prior authorization quickly. Like you said, for you, it's like better going to like bigger hospitals. I found the opposite. I went downtown here where I live. It was a little bit like of a bad experience at one of the major hospitals. But what I found is that when I went to rheumatologists who had like years of experience, like 30, 40 years, they were able to also like kind of help out faster, if that makes sense. Yeah. They've got like the, yeah. the, the time under their belt, they know how to work the system maybe a bit more. But yeah. also those doctors who like really understood the patient's perspective when it came to like doing everything they could for the patient, yeah. you know? Yeah. I, so. Yeah. I think that sometimes doctors look at us just as, you know, what they're seeing on their chart, um, blood work, our height, weight stats, all those things. They look it over and they kind of leave it at that where when, when you're experiencing something so systemic like RA or PSA, you really need somebody that's going to look at the whole picture and be um, willing to dive deep to figure out what can yeah. we best do, not just surface level treatment. Like we need the heavy duty. <laughs> and I know you like mentioned something on your Instagram. This is why I kind of like reached out to have you on here because you gave some tips in regards to like how to go about this. And it wasn't an Instagram post, I believe, or a reel. I don't know which one, but yeah. you want to kind of touch on that. Maybe your experience that you had recently. I mean, so it's always going to be a little bit stressful when you're changing medications with somebody who's chronically ill, because you know that these things are a process. You're often going to be dealing maybe with insurance battles. You don't know how long it's going to take for the medicine to kick in, or if it will even really work for you. It's, it's yeah. kind of a big chance you're taking there by switching treatments. Um, and that can be really stressful. So I try to maintain my like usual routine as much as possible, keep in contact with my doctor. And, you know, you would think and hope that you would go to the doctor, get a prescription and it would just be filled and come to you. But unfortunately that's not always the case. You have to manage your own situation. Like I was constantly checking on my portals, you know, from the specialty pharmacy and the doctor, where are we at? Um, what I have found for sure is that when you're dealing with uh, the representatives on the phone, whether it be at your doctor's office or the specialty pharmacy or the insurance, kindness and gratitude gets you a very long way because I have a feeling a lot of people get on the phone and they end up taking their frustrations out on these people. Yeah. So I just politely ask to speak to a supervisor because I have a complicated case. That's like my go-to phrase. Hey, thank you so much for your help. May I please speak to your supervisor? I have a kind of a complicated situation here. And you get sent up to the top and those people really know the system. That's how I ended up getting my methotrexate worked out. Some, one of the supervisors caught that when my doctor sent the script from changing it from pills to injection, she forgot to change the day supply from 90 to 30. That was it. But the insurance, when they deny it, they weren't outright saying, this is why we're yeah. not letting you have this. It was just coming up denial. So, you know, that extra little bit of politeness that I may have given that woman, she took the extra time to look through my case and she found that little detail that solved the problem. And now my medicine is finally on its way after six weeks of it being oh my like God. turnover. Uh, so I, I, I my this is recent. Was, this is recent. Yeah. Oh, like right now, like I'm waiting for my methotrexate <laughs> auto injector right now. <laughs> <laughs> we better see a reel from you on your Instagram yes, when it no, arrives. It is <laughs> happening. Yeah. Good, it good. is going to be like for all who have been following this journey <laughs> <laughs> the last month and a half, you know, it's, it's just a matter of like utilizing your resource. It's, I don't ever feel like badly or guilty about that because the, the, at the end of the day, I really do believe that that's who's going to be able to help me best. Yeah. It's just that I've had a lot of experiences where it seems like the people who are, who are directly handed the calls are given like a script to work off of, right? Like they've got to go through X, Y, and Z and that's their deal. When you get into a supervisor, if they ask you for a callback number, they ask you for details, they'll call your doctor's office and like start facilitating things a little bit more um, aggressively. And I actually learned that through my Instagram, I utilized my resource of all my followers who have been through similar. I said, Hey, how can I help remedy this situation? And I was flooded with suggestions because I'm sure, you know, too, now, I mean, the community that we have, 
online is quite amazing. Always willing to help or share experience of how somebody has made something work. Um, the other amazing thing I learned was that a lot of the major drug companies will cover your specialty drug cost for up to like 18 months completely if your insurance denies you. I had no idea. Nobody ever really told me that. These are things that uh, it's not always brought to you. You have to find it. Yeah, the fine print and all these little loopholes, mm -hmm. right? I pulled up your poster because I, I yeah. screenshotted it. But yeah, that's why you were saying why treatment changes can be stressful. And I just want to like point out the little points you made here because they're really good. And it says never guarantees it will work better than your current medication. And that's true. It's all trial and error. We don't know what's going to work until we try it. And that's going back to what we we're saying with like the long waiting period with insurances. It's my initial appointment talking about changing biologics was January 6th. And I have not gotten the new biologic yet. I'm on Cosentix, but it's failing. And I can, and I'm at a point now where I can feel that I can tell that that's happening. You know, like there's longer periods of fatigue, uh, leading up to another shot. My lower back is much more sore. I'm having trouble with my quality. Like it's, it's le lessening my quality of life waiting for these medications. And that's, I think what these drug companies really need to understand more is that they are they're taking away potentially our quality of life because that's what these drugs do. They alter the way that we're able to live with arthritis. So what are you doing now to kind of manage like the, the little slump that you're in? I'm all for my, uh, my prescribed drugs, but I also like to balance everything a little bit holistically. So when things like this happen, I can lean a little bit harder on that end. I clean up my diet a little bit more. I cut out, you know, any of the refined sugars the dairy treats, things like that to, to help my body, uh, daily stretching, which is really hard to do when you're flaring. But honestly, it's like the one thing that I just force myself five minute timer. Even if I can't get out of bed, I stretch in my bed because if I don't move, <laughs> the stiffness only gets worse. I'm sure you know this. Yeah. So I've been trying to stick with my routines and, um, just staying in communication with my doctor. She's been really apologetic and pushing her team to help get things done too. But sometimes Things just are not, there's miscommunications, things fall through. And um, my doctor actually mentioned that recently, uh, after this most recent spike of COVID, things have been extra sticky getting things approved. So I'm wondering if it's, you know, like any other thing, people are not at work, there's shortages, things, everything is connected. For sure. So much red tape um, around the biologics. And it actually kind of cracks me up that when you come back around, and the drug companies say, oh, we'll cover it for you. <laughs> because if you think about it, who's setting the price that the insurance doesn't want to pay? So it's like, I don't know how we end up here. Yeah. <laughs> they'll set then, the price here. Your insurance says no. Oh, we'll give it to you though. You know, even with like Humira too, I know there's like a citrate free version. Were you ever on that version? But that's the one that I was started on. That was my first ever biologic. Okay. Yeah, because I know there are some people who can't even request and they have to take that preservative too, you so, know, so. I was on different insurance back then and that was when I was still on my parents' insurance. And that one, I had no problem really getting onto it with this, the citrate free and everything. Humira worked so well for me at first and then it was such a fast decline. That's mm -hmm. why I'm so hesitant and I'm being so persistent about not taking their recommendations through step therapy because- I feel like that's part of like being your own advocate is yeah. you know, standing up to the big insurance company and saying, no, I'm not going to let you force me onto this drug that I'm not choosing. You know, yeah, because think, there could be a lot of people who feel defeated and they, they don't know like who to turn to, who to call, like what to do. And after like maybe right. five calls, two forms they fill out, they're like, oh, I'll just do it. it. You know what I mean? Because I don't think a lot of people even realize that they have a say at all because they send you this letter mm -hmm. after they deny it. And they say, here's what you can have instead. And they give you a list as if like, that's that. So yeah. if, if you don't know your avenues and your resources to use, you're going to end up, yeah, like pushed around by somebody who really shouldn't be making decisions about your medical care. Yeah, definitely. And then you said some other things here. You're like potential new side effects, increased labs, mm -hmm. which is always the case. I mean, there could always be a risk for new side effects. We know that insurance approvals. We already talked about that increased drug cost. And then like we were talking about before this call started, like Mark Cuban from Shark Tank and how he's like doing this whole like cost effective thing. Yeah. Um, I didn't read too much about it, but I know like, you know, it may be helpful for like generic drugs. That's what they're saying. Mark Cuban launches online pharmacy with generic drugs at affordable prices. I remember Boy. seeing a quote of his basically saying like, him saying, I've made my money in life. Now I'm here to like 
help people. And I think that yeah. what drug companies get away with is ridiculous. But I appreciate what he's going for. I really hope it ends yeah, me up too. something, you know, changing, game changer. It could be. That would be really awesome. Because um, actually, like for some time, I didn't have med- like Social Security cut my benefits for some uh, like unknown reason. And I wasn't supposed to be cut. So for some time, I didn't have Medicare. I didn't have insurance. Um, and it was like a huge battle. I had to hire a lawyer, a disability lawyer who actually had rheumatoid arthritis too, but he went into remission. It was like a whole saga, but, um, you know, something like this, if it was like available for people who are maybe in between jobs or they have a sucky insurance, because, you know, my friend forwarded this to me, someone I know off of social media for years mm-hmm. now. And, you know, she was telling me like, yeah, when I was in between jobs, this would have been helpful, you know, because everyone has their own like a little situation. It's not always someone yeah. who maybe have a health issue it could just be another life. Right. Situation. It could, it could be somebody you know? that just needs like, uh, I don't know, antibiotics. Yeah. Right. For, right. Uh, infection. Yeah. So I don't know, but I mean, for me too, um, it's like also supplements out of pocket. I don't know if like, you know, insurance doesn't even pay any mind to those things. Like, no, you know, don't like splints or like even physical therapy, like certain insurances will cut you and you can't go for a certain amount of times, which is ridiculous yeah. because after knee surgery and having a pre-existing condition, it's a whole different ball game. Whereas if you're like an older individual or you have a sports injury and you don't right. live with an autoimmune disease, it's like mm-hmm. a different type of like healing process. Totally. So, before I, during my time of like misdiagnosis, um, in my early twenties, I had an, uh, a scope done on my knee because it was causing me so much pain. I got referred to an ortho. Um, and he said, Oh, maybe there's like a tear in there. Let's go take a look. Um, and they sent me straight away for physical therapy after that. It was like covered. It was no big deal. Fast forward to last year, my rheumatologist wanted me to go to physical therapy, sorry, occupational therapy. And it's like, same thing, the red tape and the prior authorizations, you get X amount of visits, they cost X amount. So definitely understand that struggle. Yeah. So like insurance is really just like govern our whole lives, honestly, because it's, honestly, like, yeah. it's not just medications. And then like with the rheumatoid arthritis or even psoriatic arthritis, like we need a bunch of things to treat our conditions, not just the medications and like supplements. Right. It can be like $400 out of pocket a month. If that's what you're going for, you know what I mean? And, Sometimes. And it's not, and, and supplements are not something you want to be cheap about either, you know, cause at the right. end of the day, that's what you're putting into your body to supplement your yeah. condition. You want to have the best of the best. And I, I really think that that should be something that is covered. Like as if it's, mm-hmm. for sure, especially when, you know, I don't know about you, but my rheumatologist puts me on vitamin D in the winter because it's supportive for, um, for arthritis, but I still pay for that prescription. Um, she does write it though. So there are, I don't know how much you actually end up saving, having it written as a prescription versus picking it up at the pharmacy. But yeah, when I was diagnosed, my vitamin D was very low, which is common in pretty much everyone diagnosed with an autoimmune disease. It just, it just is. Um, but yeah, I was prescribed that, but now I just take like, um, like one from biotics. It's a pretty high end, like laboratory one, but it's like just drops. And it works well Ooh, for me. Not got a huge thing. part of like coming to terms with all, with chronic illness in general. It's just like accepting that we need aid, where, whether yeah. it comes from like a sleep aid sometimes or supplements or, you know, all the medications. It's just recognizing that it's really nobody's fault that our bodies need extra support. Yeah. And then one other thing you mentioned is like how long they can take to start kicking in. For Centix, for example, that was March, 2020. I didn't feel the effects of Cosentix for six months. I was on prednisone that whole time wow. and prednisone, <laughs> yeah. like the devil, but also the angel, like saves yeah. you, but makes you absolutely miserable at the same time. Um, so that was rough, but once it kicked in, it worked. It's just, you have to be so patient with so many aspects of life with chronic illness and dealing with these sorts of things, you know, waiting to see a specialist even sometimes takes months. If you want to see, if you don't like your rheumatologist and you want to see a new one, like that in itself can be year. <laughs> so some doctors have really long waits, the better the doctor usually awaits. So yeah, patience is definitely the key to being a forever patient. <laughs> yeah, that is so, that's a, such a good quote. Oh my God, you should try, <laughs> trademark that. that. <laughs> it's almost like you're like skeptical if somebody has an appointment next week, it's like, oh, but why? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you so available? <laughs> Things that you learn as a lifetime of like dealing with doctors. 
or it just happens at their wait list. Someone dropped off. Great, somebody dropped yeah. off. Yeah, that I would love to hear. I'd be like, great, slip me in. Yeah. No, but it's true. Like, um, I thought, well, I just lost my train of thought, brain fog, but no, I always, yeah, just took methotrexate yesterday. So it's like, I'm oh. a little slow today, kind of in a way, a slow motion. Um, but yeah, I don't think, uh, there was anything else. Yeah, no, there was nothing else on this Instagram post that you made, but I really liked that one. And that's why I wanted to bring you on here to discuss yeah, it. It's been such a journey. And I think it's something that a lot of us really have dealt with and, uh, you know, can, can commiserate about perhaps because it's, it's unfortunate that this is an added part of our lives with illness is managing, even just receiving the basic thing of medication. Yeah. And I just remembered what I wanted to say when we we're talking about doctors, like insurances, like they even stop you sometimes from seeing a certain doctor yes. you want to see. I'm like, come on. Or like some doctors don't accept your insurance or out of mm-hmm. network. And it's like, okay, well, uh, try to go see this guy then, you know, and like, I've always like with my medication, like you with step therapy, I've always like never wavered on the doctors I want to see, you know? Yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. It's important to like stand your ground. And, but once you, it takes time to learn that you can even do that. I think a lot of yes. people when they're coming into their diagnosis, they don't really realize the power that you have as mm. a patient. Like at the end of the day, nobody's, nobody can make you or tell you what to, to take. Like even when I was discussing biologics with my doctor, she first wanted me to try something other than what we decided on. It it should be always more of a discussion than a, here's what you need to do. I think that, you know, because if you're informed about your condition and your care, you should have a say. Definitely, yeah. Is there anything else you want to share with people who maybe like have gone through like what you recently went through? Be as honest and open as possible with your doctor remember like you are your best advocate you know yourself and you always have a say in your treatment you don't have to be forced into something for any reason if it's not what you're comfortable with putting into your body then say something and discuss it and there's usually another option yeah and I feel like nowadays there's always like more awareness now of what patients are going through especially Mm -hmm. like when you know a lot of organizations have gone to like Washington DC and like spoken to legislators like there's just a lot more like you know, out there now that they can't really get away with things as easily, I guess you would say like maybe years ago. Mm -hmm. So we have to thank those people too, for speaking up. Um, Even you sharing your story here too, because that's how we are making a little bit of a change for us, you know, using our voices and and not letting anybody, you know, push disabled people into the shadows because we deserve just the same quality of life as everybody else. Yeah, because I believe like in the past, if someone said, I want to talk to a supervisor, they probably wouldn't have been even given the supervisor, you know what I mean? Right. Or like and they would also, have just been ignored, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Like, you know, I, but I do think that for sure, like your um, approach and even tone can take you a really yeah. long way. Like yeah. I have been, I've, you know, I've had people be like taken back that I say, thank you, or I appreciate you to these people because they work hard, honestly, to, to help us. It's not really their faults, right? They just have the dirty work of making the calls. <laughs> yeah, they, that's, that's true. So yeah, patience and patience, being, gratitude. You know, yeah. 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 That's true. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for coming on here. And if anyone no wants to connect with uh, Megan, her Instagram and information is in the description box below. And she has a lot of amazing tips on her, her page there and, and a lot of fun reels. So be sure to check her out. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.